This video will be a little different than the videos I've been posting over about the last year or so. Normally I say bass teacher reacts and do an analysis focusing on the bass parts, but today it's perfect pitch reacts to perfect pitch because I have perfect pitch. What's up guys, welcome back to Lone University. I've done about 75 of these analysis and reaction videos so far. And one of the recent ones I did was about Mike Portnoy returning to Dream Theater. I reacted to Instrumentally and did analysis on John Myung's parts and did a little bit of celebrating because I'm really excited to see him back in the band. And I guess all the clicking around on different Dream Theater videos served me up this video. Now I've seen Drumio, drumio.com. They are an online educational platform for drums and they've expanded to piano singing. They are dominating the world in music education. Please check them out. But they did the one where Chad Smith was listening to 30 Seconds to Mars for the very first time. And I really love this series they're doing, but I wasn't aware their other sister companies were doing the same thing. And I saw this pop up and I went, Jordan Rudis, one of my favorite musicians of all time, has perfect pitch. So do I. I thought this would be a fun video because I get asked a lot, how am I able to pick out these bass fills and bass lines in a couple seconds? It's because I have perfect pitch and synesthesia, which we'll talk about shortly. I'm excited to see it. I haven't seen this video. I've seen this format, but let's get into it and I'll do my best to kind of break some walls down and some myths behind perfect pitch. Let's get into it. This is Jordan Rudis listening to Alicia Keys for the first time through piano in their studio live. He's under the gun. Let's do it. Let's, let's play a game. Okay. Since you're such a genius. This is a tough game. Oh, please. <laughs> Wizard of the keyboard. Wizard of the keys, okay. Uh, we're just gonna send you a couple of different things. This one has the piano removed. Oh. It was a very popular song on pop radio. I don't know if you'll still have pop music. That's a tough seat to be in. the pop station. I would love to try blank. this. You can't actually get to that on the dial on my <laughs> radio. <laughs> Okay, so real quick, they bring in musicians who are of great caliber. They take out the stem of their instrument and let them hear the song without it. I suppose they have access to the multi-track stems. So Jordan is hearing the song without any keys or synth parts, just to give a little briefer, although it's going to tell you that on the screen. I love the drumio ones of this. Okay, let's hear this. Yeah. Yeah, I'm up at Brooklyn. Now I'm down in Tribeca, right next to the Nero. But I'll be hood forever. I'm the new Sinatra. And this since I made it, I can make it anywhere. Yeah, they love me everywhere. I used to cop in Harlem. All of my demeaning I just hear the bass right notes. Broadway. Not at all. Me back to that but the hard part with him doing this is that he has to not only figure out the key and such of the song, but also try to imagine what keyboard part might be there. That's a whole different animal, which we'll get into in a second. I'm gonna let it play and see where he goes. At McDonald's, took it to my stash spot, still sipping my top, sitting courtside, Nick's and Nets give me high five. I'll be spiked out, I could trip a referee. Tell yeah, this is a weird one for this type of exercise. Found that B. Yeah, see, not much here. This is would be tough. <laughs> Again, once you find the key in the tunnel center, the rest is really up to your your skill as a musician, understanding the typical tropes of song structures. Now, a song like this being more mainstream, this is a very popular song. You know, chances are they're going to stick within a framework, and that's what he's putting together now. The hardest part might be for some to just find that tonic or that root note. And the thing I want to point out as this goes on is that perfect pitch does not teach you to do what he's doing right there. That is his 50 plus years of being an incredibly studied musician. Perfect pitch just gets you in the door. You know, I could hear the bass notes at the beginning, the B, the F sharp, kind of went to C sharp, but that doesn't provide me any data on what to play for the song. That comes with Again, the experience of playing and kind of understanding typical feels and tempos and styles and kind of knowing a bit about the stylistic tropes of 
Alicia Keys, Jay-Z, you know, what they might play. And it's funny they picked this because he's not a guy I would imagine to have ever learned this, as he said. But now he's plugging in around the suggested, prescribed keys and sort of chords of the song, and that's where the real expertise comes in. Can you learn perfect pitch? Can you learn how to do all of this? We'll get to that. Let's let this roll. Goes back to the one, and that would be the would be the five. This is the one, F sharp. Oh, oh, oh no. He's comfortable now. <laughs> of course he's going to do this. Everybody ride her. That oddly fits in a sort of weird stylistic way. If that was actually on the album track, but turned way down and kind of like verbed out on one side, that would be a really cool texture for this style. And again, this comes with just him having a little bit of fun with it. But once he figured out the framework of the song, which he was kind of doing, then he can open up and just do whatever over that structure. It's pretty impressive. He really hung on that B flat leading tone there because it goes. Kind of a half step down from the four. So he's picking up on that in those synth lines, it sounds like. Lots of black keys up there. F sharp's a weird key for piano to play in. Ooh. Now he's just having fun. Woo. Now where's it gonna go? This is the, this is the real tough part artistically. Oh, I guess we're just ending it there. <laughs> hey, <laughs> let's jump into the next part of the song and hear him talk about it because I want to kind of hear what he thought and what his process is, and just I would love to see him elaborate more because I've known he's had perfect pitch. He's said it a lot over the years in different interviews, but I've never seen him really candidly discuss it in a real time setting where he's using it in this way. Let's see. No. What made you make those choices? Well, first I was listening to it and I didn't know what the hell, no I have perfect pitch. I didn't even know what notes it was playing. Something about the way the bass sounded. I was like, yes. I had to really like, huh? What note is that? And once I- Real quick, that is a real true thing. Sometimes I'm in a situation where ideally it should be easy to kind of hear what the tonal center of a song is, but maybe- Maybe there's an effect on the kick drum or there's some sort of like delay or something. And that can actually crowd out my ability to find the fundamental pitch. You know, some, you know, a drum, a snare drum, a toms, kick drum, they all have like a, a fundamental pitch. If you really look and strip away the overtones, but the overtones sometimes can make it more difficult because in a way your mind is trying to latch on to anything to tell you what the pitch is. But if there's multiple overtones, especially with more produced electronic kind of elements in a song, it can make it really difficult. And I, I think that's kind of what he's commenting I on there. Kind of deciphered that. I was like, oh yeah, okay, I got this. And then when they did the whole chorus, it was at that point, there was some more frequency information that, yeah. you know, I, I could hear what notes it was. So it was like, okay, good, got it. So out of all the things that you did with that, what was like, your, what, was your, what was your favorite musical idea? Well, it was interesting because I started by playing kind of electric piano with it. 
and it, I thought that that was actually kind of cool. Like it was that an interesting was. stylistic addition to it. Because not knowing what the if there's a piano track or what it is, like. I don't know I get, what, what style yeah, is that, but I got into that mode in the electric piano. And then I guess I switched to playing lead because I was like, okay, this is, I just have some fun with this now and go crazy. And then. Um, and at the end, I switched, I just went to a category of sounds because I thought it'd be cool to play something like percussive with it. And I just went to that category. I pricked whatever sound. It really is fascinating to hear these world-class musicians just talk about their approach musically because I don't feel like any one musician is going to do it the same. Every musician is like a fingerprint in terms of how they interpret music and internalize. And I just love I mean, I could watch stuff like this all day. And what's interesting, if you go back and watch the Drumeo versions where they have, again, Chad Smith playing 30 Seconds to Mars. I think there was Dirk from Megadeth playing like Mr. Brightside for the first time. They've done a lot of them. And that's a whole different rhythmic thing, which is a whole different challenge. In some ways, it might be easier because the songs they choose aren't, you know, they're not saying listen to this dream theater song for the first time and try to figure it out. You know, that would be just a tall order and a futile effort. But songs that have somewhat of a structure you can latch on, when you get that down with the drums, you've got the time signature in a way, and it's about feeling the stops or feeling the hits coming up. And that requires just, again, years of seasoned veteran intuition. But when it comes to something melodic like keys, piano, that's, to me, way harder because you not only have to learn the chord progression, but understand how they're actually using those melodies and comping and accompaniment in the part. And I feel like if Scott's bass lessons, if you're watching this, please do one of these. I would love to come do it. If Scott's bass lessons or some other bass channel brings artists in to do this, I want to try it. I think that would be extremely tough because the whole point, the whole point of this channel is to put a spotlight on how cool bass lines can be for songs. And I've written books about this, Advanced Rock Bass by Hal Leonard. I wrote in that book that bass guitar has the most creative freedom, I think, out of any instrument in a normal ensemble because 50 different bass lines can all work great for a song. You can hug the root note, you can play whole notes, you can mirror the guitar riff, you can just lock in with the kick and the snare. You can have another iteration where you're, you're, you are your own melody that's kind of contrapuntal of counterpoint to what everyone else is doing. And to be able to understand what the original bass part was without hearing it, I mean, it could go a million different directions. So I think this would be a really fun challenge, but I kind of feel his, the pressure of, I don't know the keyboard part. What is it? I have to like really be intuitive and think what would someone play here on keys? That's really interesting to me. So now let's jump forward. I want to hear what the original key part was supposed to be like, because I'm not aware either. Sounds like with the piano in it. Yeah, I want to know. So here, here, here's a listen. <laughs> here's the original. Yeah. Yeah, I'm out at Brooklyn. Now I'm down in Tribeca, right next to the Narrow. But I'll be hood forever. I'm the new Sinatra. And since I made it here, I can make it anywhere. Yeah, they love me everywhere. Very piano heavy. All of my demeaning condos right there up on Broadway. Pull me back to that McDonald's. Took it to my stash spot. 560 State Street. Catch me in the kitchen like a Simmons with the pastry. Cruising down A Street. Off White Lake. See, now he has just a little seed of something to go off. Then he can just really let the roof blow off. It's it's pretty crazy to see, again, his mind just connect those dots like that. Driving so slow, but BK is from Texas. Me, I'm out there Bed-Stuy, home of that boy Biggie. Now I live on Billboard, and I brought my boys with me. Say what up to Tata, still sipping my ties. Sitting courtside, Nick's and Nets, give me high five. I've been spiked out, I can trip a referee. Tell by my... Yeah, that's that B-flat there, Ron. The half step down from that... Where the chorus lands there. He he kind of touched on that a bit a bit with that synth lead he did a while back. Now he's just showing off. Awesome. Okay, so that's the gist. A few points on perfect pitch. Can you learn it? Here's what I think. I think 
Well, let me just speak from my own experience. I didn't come out of the womb having perfect pitch. I don't believe I did. I maybe had an affinity for picking up notes and chords. My mom was a classical pianist. She still plays piano today. And I'm sure I was exposed to that a lot at an early age. So a lot of debate out there is, is this nature? Is it nurture? The musical gene in general is highly debated, right? And then once I started playing in middle school band and I was riding around in the car with my parents listening to Motown and funk, they always, they always had the classic radio station on. I started noticing bass lines and it would, you know, I'd go, that's the same note as that song that came on a couple minutes ago. It kind of sounds like that one note. And then I was taking piano lessons and I kind of started putting together what notes sounded like what. I mean, I just think of it as colors, right? Now, let me tie this into where I say I have synesthesia. The formal definition of synesthesia is synesthesia. <laughs> I've said that too many times. Synesthesia is when your brain routes sensory information through multiple unrelated senses, causing you to experience more than one sense simultaneously. Some examples include tasting words. That's a weird one. Or linking colors to numbers, letters, etc. So mine is when I hear a musical note, I hear a color and I don't hear a color. It's not like I hear the note G and everything just goes to a color for G for me is purple. For instance, D for me is orange. So it's not like when I hear a D, it's not like everything goes orange. I think people take that literally, but I associate the note D with orange. So when I'm hearing a song in D major on the radio that I've never heard and it's in D, I, it just, it just sounds orange to me. It's bizarre. And I always thought that was normal. And in a way, it kind of is. Think about it. If I said the name John, do you know a John? You're probably picturing a John you know when I say John. What about Ted? Do you know a Ted? If so, you're probably picturing the Ted you know. So when I say John, you're associating the name John with that particular John that you know. So when I hear the note D, I'm just associating it with orange. So do I think you can learn it? Yes, maybe. I think people, if they don't innately have that particular affinity for just hearing things that way, you can get really good at relative pitch. You can get really good at finding one note and then letting all of these other skills permeate your musical experience. So like I said, if I'm listening to a song and it's in C and it there's only two types of chords, right? There's a major and a minor. Everything else kind of stems from under there. So a major is going to sound happy. Minor is going to sound more dark and sad. So if you can hear that off the bat and find C, if the song is in the key of C, then I automatically know the likely chords that are going to follow in the song. So if it's C major, the happy one, I automatically know that most of my chords are going to exist within the C major scale. But the point is, what he's doing here is once he finds the key, which it revolved around F sharp, he automatically knows that the four chord is going to be a B major. He knows that the five chord is going to be a C sharp major. And he just knows that from being a study musician. You too can learn this stuff, but the whole trick is just finding that first seed to really explain and give you the data for the rest of the song. Again, his perfect pitch wasn't helping him play the C sharp and the B necessarily. His perfect pitch was to help him find that first note. If you watch back here. See, he's just thumbing around, trying to find just the a, a sign of life, right? Once he found the tonic and he kind of hears the tonality of the song, then he's applying what I just showed you and can figure out the rest of the song. So can you learn it? I think so. Start learning what the note C sounds like. Find three songs that are in the key of C. Every now and then, take out your guitar, bass, piano, play C. Try to really imagine what the C sounds like and be able to hum it. And once you get C down, then you might learn E. I'm not using perfect pitch to learn songs as much as I am. Just find where the road is. And that's really all I use it for. I get asked a lot too, is it cool having perfect pitch? It's a blessing and a curse. A curse is when I'm walking around the grocery store and in my head, the song playing on the PA is just registering like a tuner pedal in my head. I can't turn it off. It's, it's kind of annoying sometimes because I don't feel like I can just hear a song and enjoy it as a song. It's just registering chords in my head. It's just like data going. But that part's kind of useful when it's time to learn a gig. You know, when I got hired for Tony McAlpine, I had to learn that 
his whole set list, which is very challenging, progressive stuff in a, a week, a week and a half. And when we played the first shows, I had a few memory flubs on those first shows, but hearing where they were, knowing the pitch, it just kind of helped me. So that's the useful part of it. The annoying side of it is that, yes, everything is kind of like a tuner pedal, but I'm not driving around going, oh, that guy mowing the lawn is an E flat. You know, maybe it is, but all in all, I'm glad I've developed it. And I want to reference another really great video real quick in the description by Adam Neely that kind of blew my mind because I thought perfect pitch was kind of black or white. All perfect pitches created equal, but this video here proves that there's a lot of gradient with perfect pitch. There's relative pitch. There's absolute pitch. There's good pitch memory. So I don't really know what perfect pitch is because when you listen to that old video that Rick Beato posted of his son picking out those really complex chords. What's this? C augmento for D flat augmented. See, I don't think I could do that. I could maybe sit there and like really think about it. It might take me a minute. So th that goes to show you that everyone's perfect pitch is sort of different. Just remember that perfect pitch gets you in the room. It gets your foot in the door. The rest is on you to read the room and understand what's going on musically. And anybody can learn that. And the reason I wanted to do this video is because, yes, it is fun to do reaction and analysis videos because I can hear a song and learn it really quickly. I used to do an old segment on Twitch a long time ago. I'm not sure if I'm going to bring that Twitch thing back. If I do, it might be here on YouTube. But I would learn your band's song in one listen. It was really fun to do. And... I plan to do some more live streams soon, so stick around for that. But thank you guys. This was really fun to see Jordan learn Alicia Keys for the first time. I hope I shed some insight on what Perfect Pitch is like, how you can also learn to figure out songs in this way. You don't have to have Perfect Pitch to do what he did. That just helps him get there quicker. I love you all. Please subscribe. I had fun and hope you did too. Cheers, and we will see you next time.